Sermons given by the monks of Christ the King Abbey on Good Friday, 1998. Father Francis, OSB. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. When we are asked, do you love God? We answer, yes, I do. When we hold a crucifix in our hands, we hug it to our breasts, we kiss it, and we say, I love you, my Lord. When we hear the words of our Lord, if you love me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. We think how wonderful, and we eagerly start along the way. But when we find out where he is leading us, when we get to Calvary, when we see the cross, when they pick up the hammer and the nails, what then? Is our love such that we say, yes, my Lord? Or do we say, hey, wait a minute. I wasn't expecting the nails. When our neighbor lies to us, cheats us, despises us, do we retaliate and swear vengeance? Or do we say, thank you, my Lord, for this nail. I offer it to thee in union with the pain I felt when thou wast betrayed by one of thy own. When things don't always go our way, when our opinion is not always accepted, do we get all upset? Or do we say, thank you, my Lord, for this nail. I offer it to thee in union with thy passion and death. When we are asked to do something, Do we try to get out of it because we don't particularly want to do it? Do we try to excuse ourselves? Or do we say, thank you, my Lord, for this nail. I offer it to thee in union with thy obedience to thy Father's will. When we are dressing in preparation to come to church to visit the King of Kings, do we dress according to our own comfort and convenience? Or do we say, thank you, my Lord, for this nail of inconvenience and discomfort I offer to thee in union with thee who was stripped of thine own royal garments. When we are suffering from some physical infirmity or confined to bed with some illness, do we become restless and impatient? Or do we say, thank you, my Lord, for this nail I offer it to thee in union with thou being nailed immobilely to the cross. As we confront each nail throughout our life, we need to keep in mind these few words of Father Louis Barori 
in his book, The Ascent of Calvary. Let us pause a moment and endeavor to form some idea of this last instrument of torture. Imagine a body suspended with all its weight on four gaping wounds, which are tearing wider apart minute by minute. It is an agony from which there is no escape. The least movement increases the suffering, and this horrible torture continues for three hours. There are souls who complain of being bound to some heavy, crushing cross, without hope of ever being free from it here below. Come, stand at the cross of Jesus. I come, my Redeemer, before thee, immovable in agony, and before the nails which fasten thee to thy bloody task of redemption. I shall not, even in thought, desire to be relieved of a cross that thou hast willed should faintly resemble thine own. And yet, on Calvary, when we are laid upon that cross, do we not say, hey, wait a minute, this wood is hard. How about some padding, some cushioning? After all, I'm only human. And we have to take into account my infirmities. Let's be reasonable. And when they pick up the nails, do we not say, hey, those are sharp and ragged and rough. Let's file the points off. Let's make it smooth. And let's put some oil on it so it doesn't hurt so much when they drive it home. And while we're at it, this crown of thorns is giving me a headache. Let's do something about it. Let's be reasonable. My dear brethren, we need to look deep into our hearts and see just how much we do love God. Is my love for God a self-sacrificing love, a total, complete love for Him alone? Or is my love for God a cushioned, comfortable, selfish love. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen. Frater Paul, OSB. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. He that taketh not up his cross and followeth me is not worthy of me. Today I wish to speak about the mystery of the cross. A mystery is something that we do not readily understand. It's, it's not something we have a quick answer for. And that's oftentimes what the cross is. A sudden death of someone, um, tragic events in nature, these are mysteries to us. Suffering is inescapable for all men. 
You can hate it and be miserable, or you can accept it and even love it. Suffering from a purely human and natural point of view is an evil. It's something we try to avoid with all our might. But from a divine point of view, suffering is a good because it likens us to Christ. How we bear our sufferings shows our degree of love for God. Today we have the example before us of the two thieves who hung on the cross beside our Savior. One thief saw the cross only from his human point of view, and he cursed and blasphemed God. The other thief saw his sufferings as a just punishment for what he had done in his life. He saw the cross as coming somehow from the mercy of God, although he may not have understood mercy. He understood it, he saw it as coming from, uh, he was given a second chance. And he told God, he asked, he asked our Savior to remember him when he came into his kingdom. Half the battle is recognizing our sufferings for what they are. They are grace-filled opportunities. And otherwise, fruitless suffering can be changed into a cross as soon as we accept it from God in a spirit of faith and love for him. We should not look for people or circumstances to blame, no. But by accepting this cross from God in faith, but by doing this, it does not take away the pain. The pain still remains, but our faith helps us bear it. We then do His will and things are transformed into our spiritual advantage. Crosses, crosses are not punishments. They are sometimes a, even a blessing, for we are molded by an all-wise artist. We need to take the time to see this and to believe this as we are being molded. We must pray to Our Lady of Sorrows for a practical disposition to accept suffering freely from God and for love of Him. We cannot question why God permits or why he positively wills things that cause us pain. As I said a moment ago, the cross is a mystery. Our crosses are not generally the great sacrifices, sudden death or severe storms that do a lot of damage. No, but they are the daily, common, disagreeable occurrences 
Our crosses are made up of things that don't turn out the way we had planned them. Sickness, some anxiety, a spiritual suffering, bad will on the part of others, misunderstandings, contradictions, or just plain being a burden to your own self. But we must see God's hand in this and not look for the causes for an opportunity is then wasted when we do this. And this requires attention and deep faith. We must believe our sufferings simply as the direct effect of God's love. Or we will be miserable. We will look for escapes. Or we may even lose our mind. It is patient endurance that the cross teaches us. For how often have we not heard that time heals all wounds. Time will take away misunderstandings or contradictions or it will teach you how to be less of a burden to yourself or when things don't turn out the way we had planned them, time will take care of that too. The cross teaches us every virtue, every virtue that you can name is in the cross. Charity, humility, obedience, patience. The cross is the answer to all our difficulties and needs. But again, when we have these difficulties and needs, we must be attentive to what they are, recognizing them as difficulties, and then going to the cross for the answer. Stop and think of what Christ suffered for us all his life. When we look at the cross, there is strength. The second we stop looking at the cross, the second when we look to ourselves, there is restlessness, disquiet, searching for reasons and causes as to why we have this cross. Does this not make matters worse? Christ's love for us never wavered, not even on the cross. He showed us how to suffer with submission to the hand of God. I think it hurts Christ when he sees us handling suffering fruitlessly and all on our own. He wants us to turn to him. It was by love alone that Jesus transformed the cross and made it an instrument of salvation. Our own suffering and pain is a means of atoning for our sins and of helping us to become more like God if we have the right point of view about it. 
We must conquer our inner struggle that our sufferings cause us and say with Christ, Thy will be done. The pain remains, but the cross is accepted. The saints looked upon, the saints and holy people for that matter, look upon the cross as a privilege, a privilege to suffer for Christ. They learn to forget themselves, perhaps by getting busy with others, helping others. And they offer all to God, for they know that he craves the precious little that we feebly give him. God does love a cheerful giver. And it's an encouraging thought that the sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to come. It's a wonder to be marveled at that for a sorrow, a suffering, born with resignation, our crown hereafter is made more brilliant. This thought should help us to keep our crosses in perspective, especially the great ones, as I've mentioned. Our Lady is called the Queen of Martyrs, not only because she accepted the death of her son, but because she offered it to God. She offered it to God. She suffered unselfishly to help in our redemption. She herself was crushed and at the point of death, but we are told she stood at the foot of the cross. She didn't even collapse from grief. Her love was stronger than death. When we are confronted with our crosses, let us go to the Queen of Martyrs and ask her to teach us to carry them. And finally, we can cultivate a practical devotion to our crosses, to our sufferings, a practical devotion to the passion that is, by getting into the habit of saying little short aspirations many times a day. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. Suffering Jesus, help me. Or simply, my Jesus, mercy. Then, of course, there is the Mass. The Mass is a very practical devotion to the Passion because the Mass is the great memorial and testament of Christ's Passion and love for us. We must hear it attentively and dwell on what it teaches for its central act, its central teaching is the cross, the great mystery of the cross.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Father Abbot Leonard, OSB. There are certainly many reasons why we are here today, and uh, there are many prayers that we need to offer up today for our own intentions. But I think that one of the important prayers that we should offer up today should be prayers of thanksgiving as far as we are concerned and prayers in petition for the welfare of those who the other night uh, suffered so from the storms that we had and to pray for those who were killed the other night. This, of course, is a sacrifice for us to be here today. Um, and it is taken as such. So let us not forget to thank Almighty God for his graces and blessings toward us. As far as I know, I do not think that anyone who uh, is a member of any of our chapels or missions, I don't think anybody suffered any harm or damage or any injury the other night. So pray constantly to Almighty God that he will protect us from the ravages that come to us by way of storm or any other. Let us be mindful also that uh, though we do not wish to speak in terms of um, things to come, but let us be mindful that Almighty God, by these unusual uh, affairs and things, is that he, he is not trying to talk to us, that he's not trying to tell us something. So let us be mindful of these and let us be aware of them. Uh, Father Michael will speak next to us, and after Father Michael's sermon, we will prepare for the adoration of the Holy Cross. And then after the adoration of the Holy Cross, uh, we will have about a 10-minute break. You can go outside if you wish, or stay in the church if you wish, or whatever, and then we will con uh, continue and conclude uh, finally, uh, with the Stations of the Cross. So, let us use these hours that we're here today to the benefit of those whom we love most. And let us prepare ourselves for the coming feast, which we now know uh, is to take place in a matter of a day or so. And the first time people were wondering, but today we know this is a reliving, and we must relive. And this is the time that we should use to reconstruct our lives and to put our lives in order and to do the things that we know we're supposed to do, but that we may not have the courage enough to do these things. So pray. We must pray and we must pray much and we must show others how to pray i am told that the media actually made a startling discovery the other day the other night and the startling discovery coming from the media is that those who were praying were not injured. For the first time, the media has recognized prayer. How wonderful if that's true. So let us be mindful of the value of prayer. Pray for the welfare of the kingdom of Almighty God on earth. Offer your sacrifices. 
day in and day out for the welfare of Christ's kingdom on earth. Do not overcome, uh, do not overlook prayer, uh, reparation, penance, sacrifice. This is what the cross means. This is what we must do. Not because I said so. Or not because anybody else said so. But simply because Christ himself said so. It is, I'm sure, uh, inconvenient for people to come here uh, and to travel the distances that they have to travel at a time like this. And for those, for some, such an affair as this can be boring, can be tiresome. Uh, that's all right. Let us offer up, if it is boring, let us offer up our boredom to Almighty God. Let us offer up our boredom to Christ, if it is boring indeed. But let us offer our suffering uh, in any way, here or elsewhere, for the welfare of Christ, and think in terms of the horrendous suffering that he had to endure for us, for me, for you. For which one of you, if which one of us, can pick up the first stone and cast it if we are without sin. Which one of us can do that? So let us be mindful of our own affliction. Let us be mindful of our own need in order to save our souls. Let us not for a second be guilty of thinking that I am safe. There's not a safe person in this room right here, right now. So let us be mindful of this and let us be constantly aware of, of, of pleading with God that he will forgive us our sins and that he will give us the grace of compunction, the grace of reparation, the grace of sorrow for the sins that we have committed, that he will give us the grace of humility to acknowledge the fact that we are sinners and not just cosmetic reparation, but real reparation. Not cosmetic compunction, but real compunction. So, we will continue, and after Father Michael, um, we will t take a, a moment or two's time to get ready for the, for the, for the uh, adoration of the cross. Now, you will notice that uh, after, the, after the adoration of the cross takes place, uh, that you will genuflect then to the cross. On this day, we genuflect to the cross. The Blessed Sacrament, of course, is not in the church anymore. But today, and we, and we do not genuflect because of the, of, of the Blessed Sacrament, but as far as the cross go, goes, we shall genuflect. Then, as we all know, we will come up here and um, uh, kiss the relic of the cross, and after that we shall have benediction with the relic of the cross. And in every way, this resembles the benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. Today, the cross is impersonalized, as it were. It becomes a person, as it were. And the relics that we have, we have two relics, that we're very fortunate in having that we can trust to be authentic. We have others, unfortunately, that we cannot trust uh, to be authentic, and these are locked away someplace. But uh, at least these two that we have here in the large relic, which is still covered, and the little relic in the little case there, I think that we can be reasonably certain that these two relics are, in fact, authentic. So we are blessed to have them. Please fast forward to the end of the tape and turn to side B.